from the Key Radio Studios in Provo, Utah, and broadcasting live throughout Utah County, Sevier County, South Central Utah, Carbon County, and the Uinta Basin. It's your good friends, Mike and Heather, in the morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. It is Tuesday. The sun is out. The birds were singing really early this morning, by the way. Totally woke me up, but that's okay. That's what birds do. <laughs> yeah? You know, I wasn't even... I, I lost track of the days. You did. I, wasn't, I was thinking, isn't it later in the week? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yesterday hope, messed me up. Yeah, it was because it was a holiday, and mm-hmm. that's good. That's good. Hey, my friend, um, in the studio with us, okay, we've got Grant, of course, and he does such a smack dab good job of pushing buttons and, and sliding <laughs> faders as and all that. As far as you know, as yeah. As far as I know, you're doing a fantastic job. We are always thankful for you. Um, we also have our good friend, you know, Pastor Justin Gort of Cornerstone Bible Church in West Point, Utah. Yes, thank you so much. It's, I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, well, birds didn't wake me up. My alarm did. Yeah, well, you were up too early. For I, the, way yeah, too early. Yeah. It takes you a while to yeah. get ready and get down here. Because because you're in the studio this time. Last time you were at home and we had F-35s flying over the top. We did. Yes, yeah. and then you guys uh, hopefully got to see them when they did the flyover. Yeah, the that state. was that was really cool. And pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, but but. As much as I love you, Justin. I, <laughs> I'm okay being upstage by our guests. This okay, is great. good. I'm I'm pretty excited about this. I'll, let me just let's, let me set the stage here for the <laughs> week. And now we're on week two here. We've been talking about sin, which is like, ugh, who wants to talk about sin, Heather? Well, nobody does. That's why we're talking about it. But there's this fantastic book that I've been telling you about. We've all been telling you about called Killing Sin Habits, Conquering Sin with Radical Faith. This is written by Stuart Scott with his wife, Zandra. And um, I just, you know, I was just one, I just wanted to thank him. That's what it was. I just, I'm like, this has been such a blessing to me. And I know this has been a blessing to our Cause, listeners. Cause Heather has sin habits. I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Mike is there just to make sure that I'm humble. I'm just going to put that out there. But anyway, so I thought I'm just going to thank him. And then my little brain's like, oh, I should just invite him onto the show too and just see if he wants to. And I can't believe like blessings of all blessings. He said, yeah, let's do Tuesday. And I'm like, ah, so good morning. I'm so excited you're here. Oh, thank you. It is a blessing to be here with you all, and uh, thank you for asking. Oh man. Okay, so let's let's um let's talk a little bit about you because I've been talking a lot about you, but let's talk about who who Dr. Stuart Scott is. Well, you want the short version here of uh, you have fifty five minutes. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> a little bit about family or ministry. Well, let's let's talk about ministry first. Yeah, born in a, a home with Christian parents, and okay, ministry. I am teaching full time in the graduate program at the Master's University in Santa Clarita, California. Uh, I was at Southern Seminary uh, for ten years teaching there, and I still do that adjunctly. So full time out here in uh, Santa Clarita, and then I also serve as a membership director. Uh, for the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, the ACBC, uh, international group of about 2,000 biblical counselors. So that's kind of what I do. I do a little writing and uh, speaking. So that kind of keeps me hopping. (laughs) And how long have you been married? I've been married for 40 years uh, to Zandra, and that has been such a blessing. Mm. And... um, yeah, we met in uh, South Carolina. So she's from Sumter, South Carolina, and I was um, attending Columbia International University there. And so we met. So forty years. Okay. Amen. This past December. Wonderful. Okay. Um, I didn't ask you this before we went on, but I would love to know how the Lord, how the Lord shook you up and made him his, made you His own. Mm-hmm. So how were you saved? Yes, I uh, mentioned I grew up in a home with uh, godly parents, uh, four boys, and I'm the third (coughs) in line. And so I heard uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ all my entire life growing up and made decisions for Jesus numerous times at church camps and um, just various times. Watch Billy Graham on TV or something like that. But uh, my life was not completely given to Christ, uh, which I would call conversion, <clears throat> until 18. Uh, I was getting pretty rebellious, 
and I went to a Christian boarding school in North Carolina. And there God graciously uh, gave me uh, the ability to repent and have faith in him when I was 18. So that uh, launched a whole change in my plan. I was going to go into forestry uh, away from people. I have a <laughs> tremendous fear of people, uh, fear of man. Uh, so I didn't talk much. I thought I'd sit up in a tower and watch for smoke, you know, in uh, the forest out there. <laughs> Uh, help God take care of his general revelation. And uh, the Lord just had other plans. I went on to college just to get my gen ed. And it was there that the Lord just really got a hold of my life uh, in the sense of only two things last for eternity and uh, here on earth, and that's the word of God and people's mm -hmm. souls. Mm -hmm. And I thought I better invest in that. That would be more eternal and so there's nothing wrong about other professions. I just, for me, at that pivotal time. So I went into uh, ministry, uh, scared to speak in front of people. <laughs> and God continued to work on my own heart, my pride, uh, fear of man, and love people more than, and love God more, and uh, minister his word. Mm -hmm. So that, a short, short version. Oh, that's good. That's so um, I was worried for a second that you never sinned, and then you were able to tell us about <laughs> sin. <laughs> no, only one uh, did that, and that was Jesus Christ. Yeah, <laughs> everyone else. No. <laughs> your book uh, is written in accordance uh, with your wife, correct? She she wrote part of this yeah. book. Yes, we we do so much together. And I think that we have a little bit of a weird connection right now. So I'm going to go first while while we get that connection taken care of. Sorry, Stuart. Some of the things that she was saying, and I said, I'm not going to put my name on it without her. <laughs> so that's, yeah, it's a kind of a team uh, approach, and we, we love doing that. Okay, wonderful. Um, before we get started, because um, I know one of the first things that we're going to talk about is the gospel, I would like you, if you wouldn't mind, to tell us what the gospel is. Um, I, our our uh, listening family has heard us say it a, a million times, and sometimes um, another person could say the exact same thing, but just in a different way, and then really connects with their hearts. Is is Can you do that for us? Well, yes. I mean, I uh, when you're talking about the gospel, it's the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, truly God and truly man, uh, eternally God, eternally, and, and came as, took on humanity, so fully man, yet without sin. So it's the good news of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Uh, and it, it starts, you know, with Romans 3 of that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we, there was no hope. And I kind of cover that, um, I think I do in the book, uh, that man tries to work his way uh, to heaven. If we could do that, then Christ didn't need to come and die for our sins. And uh, Galatians 2, uh, 21 says, um, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So man can't keep the law. He tried and he can't. So in our hopelessness, uh, because if you have one infraction, you've, you've committed all of, uh, broken all of the law in James chapter 2, verse 10. And so Christ, uh, God, and his love for man and his sin, uh, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, took on the form of humanity, lived a completely perfect life uh, according to the law. He obeyed the law in every respect, totally righteous. And so what we uh, need to do and what Christ did is he then died for our sins. Of those that would repent and believe in him, he died for our sins and then if we will repent and believe in him as our Lord and Savior, 
that that is a gift. We don't come up with our own faith. He graces us with faith uh, to believe and totally believe. That's our thoughts, our affections, our will in Christ, in Christ alone, that he will forgive our sins, cleanse us, take our sin away, and then give us his righteousness, put his righteousness to our account so that we are then accepted by God through Jesus. And then he rose from the dead, victorious over the grave, and his promise to soon return. So it's the the John 3, 16, he loved the world, he gave his son, that whoever believes in him and keeps believing and trusting fully in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, I love I, that. I love that. And I would love to know, um, for, for our friends who are listening, how do I know if I've believed enough? How, how do I know if I have saving faith? Uh, you know you have saving faith. At least First uh, John was kind of written for that purpose. How do I know that uh, I truly have saving faith? And it, if you have the right doctrine from Scripture— it's built on that. Right beliefs lead to right actions. So the right beliefs of who God is, who Jesus is, uh, what sin is, uh, what our inability is uh, to save ourselves and our fully trust in Christ. Then there is a, a love for God and a love for, for other people. That's in First John as well. And we're really loving God, loving other people. Uh, we have turned from sin. We've embraced Christ. We're totally going to live for him. Uh, and that obedience, that we're obeying uh, the word of God, uh, not to be saved, but because God did save us. Now we have a desire to love him and obey his word. And usually those are the, the, the major test or uh, legs of a stool that faith rests on mm -hmm. in uh, the book of First John. And then you can know that you have eternal life. Usually when someone's doubting, uh, I go, uh, what their beliefs are, uh, are, do they really believe in God, man, sin, the Savior, what it means to repent and believe, the key doctrines, and then are they loving God and loving others, and are they obeying what God said? And when those are three are solid, they're usually not doubting. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're talking about the obeying part of things, aren't we? <laughs> yes, yeah, that, that was the next portion is, you know, if— if you are saved and you have come to faith in Christ, and then you find yourself in these habits, these these problems, uh, I love the uh, page three illustration that you have in your book um, of that temptation lust cycle, where it starts with temptation and it ends with isolation, and in, in almost in the middle is that uh, sin is accomplished. You know, reminding us of what James wrote. Um, so, would you tell us about uh, the believer in Christ, the one who comes to faith in Christ? secure, uh, settled in heaven, according to Ephesians chapter 2, um, but struggling with sin. Yeah. How how does that work? How can a person who is saved and changed and made new still walk in sin? Yes, and that, um, <laughs> when you get into who we are in Christ and what he has done for us, and we are now in union with Christ because of his blood that was shed and and brought us to himself by faith. Uh, when that happens, uh, we still have the flesh, the sinful flesh um, that continues to be the in inward enemy, the inside enemy, as John Owen, the Puritan mentioned, it's the enemy within. Um, and we have Satan as well as an enemy, and then the world system and philosophies as an enemy. But that flesh is something that we deal with every single day. Uh, it is a war within uh, that will end. It won't last forever uh, when Christ returns or we die to be with him. Uh, that will that will cease. All the enemies will cease uh, as far as uh, attacking us. But until then, it's a process of change. It is... Um, um, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, as it says, and then make no provision for your flesh to fulfill it and its lust thereof. And so there is this war that is going on ever since 
um, we, by, by grace through faith in Christ, were saved, it will continue till Christ returns or our death. And that's the battle that you see even through all of the, pretty much all of the epistles and the New Testament of just the, the struggle. Uh, and yet we can live in a way that pleases the Lord um, as we exercise the faith that he has given us. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think, Dr. Scott, that um, you should have asked my husband, Mike, here to name your book for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, because um, what he decided to call our little series here um, was Killing It, Bro, or Don't Eat Your Vomit, Dog. Yeah. <laughs> Coming from yeah. Proverbs twenty six eleven, which is like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Mm-hmm. And we have a tendency to hear the word folly and think, you know, maybe like a circus clown or that sort of thing. But folly is actually very serious. We're talking sin here. So um, and we have a tendency. We have these pet sins. And these pet sins are our special, oh, we love them so much. But then we struggle because we want to get rid of them because we know we know that God does not like the sin. I mean, Christ died for my sin. So this is a pretty big deal. Um, but it has a tendency. We have a tendency to return to it. And and that is that is really why I love this book so much that you've written, because these are sin habits. These aren't something that like, whoops, and I'll never do it again. It, these are this is talking about and it could be anything from addiction to infidelity to anything. Um, and, and so we've been really enjoying uh, just going through your book, having these conversations about this, we are at this point now where it's kind of like, okay, well, I want to honor the Lord. I understand the gospel and I am, I, I don't want to dishonor God, but I keep finding myself in these, these sin habits of my pet habit here. Um, what are some hindrances? And this is, I'm just looking right on chapter nine of your book here, that you have listed a number of hindrances uh, to what you say, a grace pursuit. Can you help us with that and identifying these? Because I have a feeling some of us are going to be like, oh, that's me. Oh, that's me. (laughs) And and don't sugarcoat it. (laughs) Yeah. No, and I'd be glad to. And what I'll do is I'll like skip a, like a rock on water here and you can, follow up with questions uh, if you want. But uh, the first one I started with is if a person hasn't truly uh, turned from self and sin to embrace Christ by grace through faith, if they've not done that, I mean, not a decision necessarily, but a life that you keep trusting in the Lord, then yeah, you're you're gonna be in sin, you're gonna love to sin, you, you won't be able to stop the sin uh, in reply to groups where they try to stop sin, sinful habits, but that's trying to break habits. And the Lord tells us, don't do that, replace them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you do that through the power of the gospel and the power of the spirit of God who indwells us. But if a person is not saved, they're not going to be able, they probably won't even have the desire uh, to replace it. Sure. Well, and what I really appreciate. So that, that's the first one I start Sure. And what I really appreciate about like throughout your entire book, and this is this is just truth, but we can't, we just simply cannot in our own power get over our sin. And you make it so specific. It's in Christ, in Christ. If, if I were to find one repetitive thing in your book, it would be it's all in Christ. We are able to do this. And and we have a tendency, like you said, we, we're so worried about behavior modification. And it's like, no, we have to allow the Lord to transform our hearts. We're supposed to be new creations and we can't be new creations. God has to make us new. Uh, so I, I the first thing, if you are not saved, all of what we're talking about today, it's really going to it might not really apply. We got to start with the basics and the first things first. And those first things, it's all about Jesus, my friend, and you need to submit Mm. to him. And I'm appealing to you today. If you are here, it's listening to this. It's not by any accident. Okay. God has appointed you to hear this right now. Today is the day of salvation. If you are exhausted and you are tired of trying to be perfect, trying to perform well, trying to make everybody think that you are great, trying to appease God, knowing inwardly in your heart you are just a dead man walking, 
Today is the day you go before the Lord and you just submit to him. Tell him, yes, Lord, I acknowledge I am a sinner and I need saving. And I know that Jesus has done that for me. And I know, I know that if I just put my trust in him, I will be saved. And Lord, I want that today. And then, my friend, what you need to do after that is celebrate with us. Give us a call mm-hmm. <laughs> and let us know because we want to we want to just rejoice with you and then give you some resources, connect you with some people. Um, very, very, very important, but it starts right there. Yeah, and if, if you're thinking of this and still have questions, call us here at Key Radio, 855-539-4583. You can also go to our website, keyradio.org. Click on the Eternal Life button. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to go to a trivia question. Then we'll take a short break. Okay, and you can get some coffee then. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Here we go. All right, we're ready. From the complete book of Bible trivia, what blood-sucking creature (laughs) is in Proverbs held up as an example of something that can never be satisfied? What (laughs) blood-sucking creature creature. is in Proverbs held up as an example of something that can never be satisfied? Okay, my friend. If you know the answer, this is disgusting, Mike. Just want to let you know. <laughs> uh, you give us a text, 855-539-4583. That's 855-KEY-GLUE. can also put a uh, comment in our Facebook live feed. Good morning, Mom. Thanks so much for letting us know you're listening. You're listening to Mike and Heather in the morning. Justin Gortz with us and Dr. Stuart Scott. Key Radio, Life Unlocked, Truth Unleashed. We're so glad to be with you today. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Mom. I want to say hi, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Should we finish our trivia yes, question? Yes, finish we, this trivia. We have a tendency to give a trivia question and then forget to give the answer. Do we have any guesses on Facebook? No, no. Everybody's too... They just want to get back to talking to and listening to Dr. Okay. Scott. But so. first, yeah. what blood-sucking creature <laughs> is in Proverbs held up as an example of something that can never be satisfied? Our answer... Vampire bat? <laughs> Stop. No. Oh. no. You're supposed to be a pastor. Oh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> you know the answer. I know you do. We did. We just talked about it. Yeah. The leech. The leech, yes. See, now when you said held up, I was thinking actually like in Proverbs, they were holding <laughs> up <laughs> physically. I don't Raise know. high your leech. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a sacrifice in, in the book of Leviticus that is one of my favorite sacrifices, and that is the heave sacrifice when when Aaron and his sons uh, from from the priesthood were to take uh, a, a section of the the bull and to raise it over their head, it was a heave <laughs> offering to the Lord, and I just I love that picture of of worshiping God and just honoring Him and just hefting it up. So I am not a hand raiser, but what I does love it have to do with leeches? And, oh, I'm sorry, it has nothing to do with leeches, but you know, going to what what Heather was saying. So our trivia question came from Proverbs thirty fifteen. Okay, now let's get back to something more serious. <laughs> Dr. Scott <laughs> is with us, and we have the opportunity to uh, hear about how we can uh, have these hindrances removed from our life. If you are a believer, uh, what is the next one, Dr. Scott? Well, I, I mentioned eight of them in the, the chapter there, but I would like to just focus probably out of a lot of these here the ignorance of theology, the ignorance of what the Bible teaches about truth, because we get into so many errors. Uh, it's number six in the list of eight. And I find this was my problem early on. I didn't know God's word that well. And I was taught just let go and let God. Uh, so I was just being barely passive. Oh, we uh, hear that Lord all the time. Me. We hear that all the time. Well, let go and let go. Yeah. Everybody loves that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're saying that's yeah. bad theology. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it <laughs> won't. It, it, it's it's great for not my will, but your will be done in our decision making. But it's terrible for growing as a Christian. You're passive. And the New Testament, the Lord tells us there is work to be done. You have to work out your salvation, not for it, but you work it out. But it's by the Spirit helping you. But God will not obey for us. That's just really key. You can't just say, Lord, take my lust away, take my problems away, take my difficulty away. He won't obey for us. He will help us obey, but he will not do it for us. He will not pray for us. He will, all the one another's have us as the subject 
and doing it by the power of the Spirit, but he will not do all of the commands for us. Oh, I and like that was huge. I like that. So practically for for the parent who wants to stop yelling at their kids, um, who who realizes this is not an effective way to parent, uh, where is the ignorance in that? Where is the the need for knowledge of how to control one's mouth and and react in a in a godly and holy way? Yeah, and then it, it would be well. There, I would explore a few things there. What are they wanting? That their anger is coming out because James four says we we desire things and we want things so much our lusts uh, on an idolatrous level that we war and we fight. And so anger would come right in there. You know, I'm angry at my kids because I'm not getting what I want. And uh, it, it, it's idolatrous and rather than what does God want? And then how in his spirit controlled way can I pray? Can I think what is best here? Not attacking my children, but how do I help build them up? It may involve, it will, some discipline training and some instruction that Ephesians 6 uh, tells us about. So the anger is just a manifestation of usually what I'm wanting and I'm sinning to get it mm. or sinning if I don't get it. Wow. That kind of puts a <laughs> different perspective for parents, right? Because normally it's the yeah. kid you're yelling mm. at because it's the kid yeah. who is screaming because they want it or they didn't get it. So, but you're just reacting and same. So that's it's kind of a scary thing, but that's all stuff um, that you can find in God's word. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Well, if you're yeah. too busy yelling at your kid for that, maybe you need to check yourself. Justin, do you have any other sins that you want to talk about yeah, today? Justin, yeah, Justin. Not... <laughs> oh, I have so many. Uh, he is a counselor. We could just go with yeah, this. <laughs> so when I... <laughs> but in reality, you know, our our friends who are listening, they're, they're, they're struggling with real issues. Yeah. They are welcome to... Call in there. Or I'm sorry, texting text in and or, Facebook in. Yes, absolutely. Uh, if so, if there's a specific question that you have and you want help with that, uh, we have a trained professional who is willing to answer questions on those, and we would love to hear mm -hmm. uh, what Dr. Stuart Scott says about uh, your issue. And if you want that to remain anonymous, you can message in, and and K E Y Y will not share your name. That's is that right. Correct? Yeah, just give us the text eight five 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 three nine four five. Eight three. That's eight five five. Key glue. Um. Yeah. Um. Talking about the ignorance of theology. Looking at. I. I have a tendency when I'm reading a book. I like to write to the author. It's exciting that I actually get to talk to you today. But um, it, your line in there. Um. Under ignorance of theology, I underlined. I was actually expect. What I was actually expecting was for God to obey me. I just wrote. Ouch. I mean, <laughs> that really yeah. kind of puts things into perspective. And and we have a tendency to do that and we need to be very careful and and we there's a passage i think it's in first thessalonians where um that god is faithful and he will also do it um and so we will usually put that kind of thing into our mind and think well god will take care of me god will do this i'm a new creation he'll create but we uh, we we don't see the work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We don't see that. We try to ignore those things. And that's a very dangerous place to be in. But it seems to be setting up a gray area. Like it's, we have to be working towards this and, but God is doing it. How do we walk in that? What, what's the balance? Is it 5%, 95%, 10? <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, it's a hundred percent us working dependent a hundred percent on the spirit of God who's enabling us to do it. And so it's just praying without ceasing. It's Philippians two. Uh, I mentioned verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then the next verse, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so I just like, well, who, who's really working here? Both are. It's a hundred percent me dependent on the, on the spirit of God to enable me, to give me the right desires from his word, to get, get me focused on Christ. So I can't, I cannot, if I'm passive, I'm going down. Mm -hmm. I'm going backward if I'm passive. It's like walking up a down escalator. You're not going to be in the same place. You're, you're going to go backward. So if, I, if I've done a sin three times and, and I, I realize I know this shouldn't be part of my life, I, I desperately want it to stop. 
But I, I don't know how to stop it. I read God's word where Jesus says to the, the woman uh, caught in adultery, go and sin no more. I yep. read about what, what is said that we as believers should uh, walk in holiness and, and we should put on uh, love and gentleness and, and all of these things. But how do I break ignorance? Where do I go for, for finding truth? Yeah, and that, again, is back into that theology, doctrine. Doctrine is so practical. It's like, okay, what does the Lord tell me? What do I need to do? It's not break habits. Don't try to stop sinful habits that you won't, it won't work. Mm. Uh, you just go to another sin. And that's typically what happens in a lot of the different groups. They try to stop a sin, they go to another sin. It's always replacing it. And so on page 61 and following, I give several things that can help them refocus and how to lay the weight and the sin behind as we run this race and just real practical things on every day. It's often called the spiritual disciplines, but it's in the word more. And you think about, I think the average time now is people reading the Bible, it's like 20% of uh, at least a survey read the Bible once a day. I mean, it, it's really pitiful the amount of time Christians are in the Word, but when you go to social media and TV and entertainment, it's hours and hours of that. And so we're not going to really make progress if we're not in the Word of God transforming our minds and our thoughts, which is really key in that. So it's meditating on Christ. Um, it's uh, in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 2.13, it's so focused on the fountain of living water, which was Christ, then you won't be drinking at the broken cisterns that hold no water. It, if we're not drinking from Christ and his word and with his people uh, and prayerfully done, we will be drinking from the broken cisterns, the sinful habits and the uh, the fleshly lusts. Mm. It seems to me that if we're not doing that, if we're if we're dealing with a, a sin habit that we know is destroying our lives and the lives of other people, and then I'm hearing you, Dr. Scott, and saying, oh, you just want me to read the Bible? Uh, okay. And then they throw it away. Then really what we're saying then is Christ isn't enough and my sin isn't that bad. Um, and, and, and it does take discipline. We are so, I think about Naaman, remember Naaman and he had leprosy and this little young girl goes up to him and says, go and talk to, I think it was Elijah, was Elijah or Elisha, one of the guys. And, uh, and then he said, go, go in the water. And he was so furious. He's like, this is gross water and I don't want to be there. And this, I mean, he was angry because he wouldn't even talk to him. And then his servant said, well, you know what, if, if he asked you to do all these hard things, you would have done it in a minute. Why don't you just try this? And I think that's kind of the same thing that we see ourselves with our sin, right? It's like, you just tell me to read the Bible and go to Jesus and that's it. Uh, well, why don't you try no. that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that won't be enough because just reading it, it, that won't change us. Right. It's the beginning. It's the, uh, you fundamentally foundational but then you have to meditate on it, which now you you go over and over it into now, how can I apply what I'm reading into my life? And so I walk through various things that can be application oriented and even into a battle plan at the uh, appendix one in the book is here's a battle plan. I mean, I'm up against an enemy every day. What's my battle plan? And it real practical things to do, everything from thanking God and praising him to serving other people, to not making any provision, because that's often the case is for a lot of sin habits, there's provision. Mm -hmm. uh, overeaters have their pantry stocked, you know, and it, it's like it's, it's a few feet away. And so they're going, well, help me not to overeat. Well, the, the provision's right there. So it's it's removing provision and it's practically applying what we're reading in scripture. So reading alone won't change you. Hearing the word alone won't change you, but it's applying it. So doctrine should always be applied. Mm -hmm. You keep hearing the word doctrine and that always gets people a little bit squirmy, right? But this is really important because 
<laughs> if you don't know what you believe and then you're not apply, then you won't apply it. And your belief just becomes like, uh, I don't know, like I, it's nothing. It's nothing because we're supposed to be believing in what you believe you act upon. So if I believe that my sin is grievous toward the Lord, if I believe that the Lord is going to help me through this, if I believe that through Christ, I have the power to defeat this. If I, you know, if I start believing and we talked last week, all those truths, the foundation, like, what does this mean? What can I stand on? And if we believe those things, then we will act upon them. We won't provide, we won't have provision for our sin as well. But there's that word doctrine and that scares people. People, and we have to get over that. Well, and that yeah, brings... and it's doctrine is truth, right? Doctrine is truth, and that's how we're sanctified. That's how you come to know the truth about Christ. That's doctrine. It's it's truth about what God says is revelation. So even in uh, John 17, you know, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So it, that's doctrine. Doctrine is just truth. But truth should always be applied. And I think people get scared because, well, it gets too deep, sometimes uh, hard to understand. And then also a lot of times doctrine, they don't ever take it to application. So then it's just sitting there and it's pretty dry when it should be uh, very much alive and changing us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it's doc doctrine is just truth. And uh, if we don't know truth from Scripture about all the various things in our life, then we will be susceptible to error. Mm -hmm. Wow! Can yeah. can believers fall into to error? Let Let's talk about that for a second. Um, is are are there any times when when you have counseled or or you have uh, helped those who believe in Jesus to to escape uh, those false beliefs? Have you seen success stories? Is what I'm trying to get at of people yes. actually change? Because we hear we hear in time and time again people don't change. Oh. Uh. Well, yeah, I, um, I was there for many years. I wasn't mm. changing much because I was that passive, let go and let God, let God do it all. And I'm going, man, I know I'm a believer. I just, I'm not dealing with these various lusts and struggling with them over and over again. So that, um, uh, I understand that. I mean, I understand a very little change. Let's put it that way. Um, uh, minimal but yes, all kinds of what we would call success of people changing and growing when uh, they realize that when they are saved and in Christ, now they need to know what Christ taught them in his word and then how to apply it. I always hear people say, well, I know that. I know I should <laughs> stop yelling at my kids. I know I shouldn't be looking at those things on the internet, but how? How do I do this? And that is where, at least in my opinion, biblical counseling uh, takes the word of God and let's break it down on how to start doing this. How do I put on Christ and how do I not make provision for my flesh? And so that's why I kind of wrote the book is to kind of bring things down to real, uh, I think, where the sheep can just get it and use it and understand it and apply it. So it, it just... It's what the Word of God teaches us. It's truth applied, but the how-tos seem to be missing in a lot of um, teaching, sometimes a lot of preaching. It's just, here's what the truth is, now let's close in prayer, and it doesn't get into, how do I apply this? Okay, let's talk about bad company. Hmm? Mm. And I'm not talking about the band from the 80s either, in the 90s. Um, and this is this is something that can really hurt a lot of people. Um, you cite in your book, 1 Corinthians 15.33, bad company ruins good morals, do not be deceived, and so on. Um, let's talk about, I'm dealing with sin, this is very difficult, but I have certain elements in my life. What do you have to say for that? Yes, bad company, and I put in the... Uh, that little paragraph there, hanging around non-believers, non-Christians, uh, who don't have as their goal uh, to glorify God, uh, to walk in holiness, to hate sin. When you're around that much, it, you tend not to influence them, they tend to influence you uh, in the sense of company, of friendships and a lot of time with them. I mean, obviously we wanna witness to those who are unsaved, but also Christians who are fleshly, Christians who aren't growing much, Christians who are apathetic, 
uh, satisfied for the level of growth where they're at, that can be really bad too. Uh, if if that is, are your close friends, then you trying to make steps towards Christ likeness won't go well with them. Like, why, why are you doing that? Why don't you do what we're doing? So both un- unsaved people uh, as close friends, that's what we're talking about, close friends and fellowship, can bring you down morally, but also weak, immature, fleshly, professing Christians can do this, have the same effect mm-hmm. and bring you down morally. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a tough thing to hear. Um, and I just remember, you know, just as following Christ and then all of a sudden my friendships have changed. And many mm. times people will hear us say words like, you know, ba- the bad company thing. And they'll say, well, who do you think you are? Um, are you holier than thou? And that sort of thing. But it does make a lot of sense. Right. Because. Um, people do influence other people. It's like even if you're looking at the news and you're feeling very depressed or something, well, looking at the news isn't going to help your situation, right? That's an influence that you're struggling with. And so it makes sense. But people get very upset with hearing that, oh, I'm not good enough for you now. What do you say to those people who are afraid to offend their friends? Yeah, that's a great question, Heather. I- the thing I would never quote that verse to someone, <laughs> you know, good. Uh, bad company clubs, good. Enough, so I can't hang around with you because that would really come off very uh, arrogant mm. and not the right use of that. But what I would point them to is, listen, if you're around people that aren't helping you really on a, a fast pace to know Christ and want to pursue holiness in their life as a Christian, I think of uh, Luke chapter six, where the Lord in the Beatitudes says, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude or ostracize you and revile you and and spurn your name as evil on account of the son of man. And so I take that verse and I go, you know what? You just go after Christ and you encourage them to do the same. And what will happen is either they will start following uh, after Christ and making changes in their lives, or they will ostracize you. They will push you away. You don't have to push people away. They'll push you away if you're trying to really go on a fast pace to know Christ and live for him, and you're saying, come along with me as I follow Christ. Mm -hmm. The friends will just, I mean, those, those people will either come with you, or they will stiff arm you and say, I, I don't think so. Don't really want to go to church with you. I really don't want to pray with you. I nah, no thanks. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? It, it just, they'll push you away. You don't push them away. Yeah, that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm watching the, uh, I'm watching the screen and I shouldn't be. Um, that, that does <laughs> make sense. Yes. Uh, that does make sense. You know, I, I have some friends who are concerned that Christians are not known by our love. That there's so much division mm. among us um, that you know we we all claim to to follow God and and His Word, and yet there's there's so much difference between us. And but what you're saying is that those who follow God in truth are going to hold tight to His Word. They're going to hold tight to the Bible, and that there are going to be some people who are going to to wander away from us because of that. Is that it, am I stating that yeah. correctly? That, that's right. And that's what Jesus said. It, that's exactly what Jesus said there. You follow Christ and you encourage others to do the same. And they will part from you or they'll come with, with, you, with you and know Christ mm-hmm. better. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk. I, the other thing I, I liked was just the misplaced priorities um, that you had indicated as, as another stumbling block, if you will. Uh Misplaced priorities in dealing with my sin habit. How do, how does that play into trying to to conquer this? Yeah, misplaced priorities. Boy, that's a daily <laughs> struggle. <laughs> Is uh, I mean, all day long there's things vying for our at- attention, and it's easy to get caught up in the temporal. Mm-hmm. What we're going to eat, drink, and wear. 
um, in the virus situations. We're just caught up in the here and now. And the Lord constantly wants us seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness and eternal things in Colossians chapter three, uh, really focused, you know, in Luke chapter 11, I mean, uh, Luke 10, it's the same kind of thing of uh, prayerfully in the word, Lord, how can I seek eternal things today? What's mm -hmm. most important today that would please you versus sometimes, um, and I do have to do regular mundane things, but I can do them for God's glory and be thinking about the Lord and uh, how I can love and serve others as well. So that's a, I think of Martha and Mary, um, misplaced priorities. I think of focused on breaking cisterns rather than drinking at the fountain. That's a misplaced priority. Mm -hmm. Um, is that helpful? I, I just oh, um, I think so. I think so. And and many, reminders. Things yes. We can do for remind I I think so. And sometimes we are so busy worried about what we might lose by tr dealing with the sin mm -hmm. habit by by going away, not providing for it, and the whole bit that we forget what we have, and that is Christ. And yeah. And because that temporal yeah. is always before us, and. So the misplaced priorities thing, I, I think identifying that is so crucial in our walk, in in our struggle, and ultimate our victory over sin. Um, is Jesus better than, and then fill yeah. in the blank? And of course he is, because he is yeah. everything. Yeah. And and as a believer, you you have to remind yourself daily of that. I think reminding yourself daily of the truths found in God's word um, reminding yourself of the gospel, pure and simple. A, a gospel isn't just a, hey, I'm saved and now that's it. I mean, we live the gospel. And especially when you're dealing with these sin issues, you have to remind yourself at what cost, Heather? At what cost, Justin? Right? At what cost the, did God was my sin paid for? It was great. It was great. It, it cost Jesus his life. And if he, he did that for me, well, I think I think dealing with this is, is good, and I can do that for him. Because ultimately, it's for his glory if I overcome the sin issue, right? Oh, yeah, and right. Titus 2 tells us he did it for a reason, that we would be mm -hmm. zealous for good works. We we mm -hmm. read at the end of Ephesians uh, 2, 8, 8 through 10, that, that great passage in verse 10, that God has prepared good works that we should walk in. Uh, they're already prepared for us, and and then we are reminded that as believers in Jesus, we are new creations, and we get the opportunity to serve him, to follow him, and to do these things. So uh, the victory portion, uh, Dr. Scott, when I have killed a sin habit, is it eternally gone? Or do I have to be vigilant about that uh, in the days to come? Yeah. Yeah, great question. And killing, the uh, word mortify in Romans 8, uh, it, it's talking about subduing it that it's practically dead. But as we know, you if you're not vigilant, as you mentioned, uh, on a daily basis, of uh, putting on Christ and, and making no provision for it, it'll rise back up. It'll be like a zombie. I mean, it just comes a, like, <laughs> there it is, walking the walking dead. It, it's coming back. So yes, mortification is subduing it um, so that it has no power. It doesn't have the power anymore in the hold that it once had. But if we let up, he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. So it's constantly pursuing Christ, as Heather mentioned there. I mean, constantly pursuing Christ and making no provision. So I would say 80, 90 percent of your effort is putting on Christ, vigilant, uh, zealous, and then maybe 10, 15 percent making sure I'm not going back and making provision for that fleshly lust. Mm -hmm. In the, we only have a couple of minutes left here. And do you have any just words of wisdom to share with those of us who are really struggling today? Did we lose him? I, we might have lost him. Um, 
What Here about? we were in the important part. And the important part. Okay, Justin, go. All oh, right. So on chapter uh, page seven. No, this uh, his book is so encouraging to me. Um, he just has some practical things for those people who are struggling uh, today. Um, and, and numbers 10, 11, and 12 of what he, he talks about repeating patterns, about uh, how we can break them. Uh, Christ is to be put on and provisions for the flesh are to be eliminated. Um, we are to seek outside help. Mm-hmm. You know, it's okay to ask for help. Oh, it's, okay to, it's okay. It's <laughs> okay to bear one another's burdens. And then as time passes, we are uh, given the opportunity um, to make the, the best decision, mm-hmm. uh, the decision that's going to encourage my heart today, my family, my church, my my sphere of community influence. I have the opportunity to do those things today. And that is such an encouragement because I know it, it hurts when we're down. I'm, I've got a friend right now who is dealing with stage four cancer. And so for him to walk with Christ is encouraging. Mm-hmm. Wow, our time went so fast. Sorry we broke up at the last minute there, uh, Dr. Scott, but we thank you so much for leading us and for your book. This has been so encouraging. Killing Sin Habits. Killing Sin Habits by Dr. Stuart Scott. Thank you for listening to Q Radio. This has been Mike and Heather in the Morning, a production of Key Radio, located in beautiful Provo, Utah. For more information about the program and the ministries of Key Radio, check out our website, keyradio.org. On behalf of Mike, Heather, and the entire Key Radio staff, have a blessed and glorious day.